So again, welcome everyone to our Ask the Experts About Voting. We appreciate you being here. Um, I know at the beginning of all of our meetings, we always start in the same way. And we're gonna start the same way again with reading our statements of principle about who we are as a group. And it holds, I've been thinking about this and for me it holds significant meaning at this moment in time when we're in such a divisive era, um, even in our small community. So the League of Women Voters of Northern Lower Michigan is a nonpartisan political organization and does not support or oppose any political party or candidate at any level of government. We encourage informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League of Women Voters of Northern Lower Michigan is an organization fully committed to diversity, equity, inclusion in principle and in practice. The League of Women Voters also acknowledges the land we serve as the traditional territory taken from the Anishinaabeg tribal nations and honor their roles today in taking care of this land. And then offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. So welcome to our public forum on the voting process organized by our Voter Services Committee of the League of Women Voters, Northern Lower Michigan. Again, we're gonna start with a little etiquette. Please stay on mute for the presentation and also click on speaker view. And that way you won't be distracted by all of our, our faces, backgrounds and spouses wandering in the back and barking dog. Um, jot down any questions you have during the presentation because our Q and A is gonna be at the very end. And please do bring your questions. Um, I will, we'll learn a lot from what you have, have questions on. We'll conclude the public forum at 6.30, after which we're going to hold a brief members meeting. As we all know, voting is very much in the news these days. Some of the information is misinformation, which means sharing information without harmful intent, maybe because of a misunderstanding or lack of the facts. Some of the information is disinformation, which means there is a harmful purpose. And currently with voting, there is an effort to undermine confidence in our democratic processes, the first and foremost, which is voting. Studies also support the notion that most American citizens are now well versed in the actual process of voting. So it makes for some fertile ground for mis and disinformation. The 101 year old mission of the League of Women Voters is to promote fair and open elections and educate citizens to be informed and engaged voters. Our goal is not who gets elected, but that the process is understandable, accessible and secure and that voters feel confident and informed about participating. We'll ask questions and find what goes on behind the scenes and hear from them what happens when we cast our ballot, when and how and how the final results are reported. We'll then turn to all of you for questions uh, and answers. Our plan is to leave the discussion better informed and better able to counter disinformation with the facts. So we thank our local clerks for participating in our public forum. I'll now turn our forum over to our Voter Services Committee member, Susan Hanna, who is our moderator for tonight's discussion. Susan? Tonight's forum asks the clerks how voting works. Uh, to call in to understand how the process works, we called in the experts, as Robin mentioned, our local township and county clerks. Why are they the experts? Because they are elected officers who have lots of legal responsibilities, but among them is to administer elections in their jurisdiction in keeping with Michigan state law and with regulations that come from the Michigan Secretary of State. They're the ones who work behind the scenes to make sure that the vote is accessible and the vote is secure. And they're the ideal source for the real facts about the voting process. So thanks again to all of, to our three clerks, Debbie Bosma from Pleasant View Township, Julia Droist from Charlevoix County and Susie Kadeen from right here in Emmett County 
for agreeing to talk about how it all works and to answer our questions. We've divided this discussion up into three basic steps. First, what happens before you vote? How do you register to vote? How do you get an absentee ballot? The whole, everything that happens before you cast your ballot. Then the second part is the actual voting process. How do you vote? How do you physically vote? How do you vote in person? How do you vote absentee? And the third step is counting the vote. How do those votes get counted? How do the results get recorded? How do they get reported up the line to the county, to the state? Throughout the whole process, we're going to be interested in how the process protects against somebody cheating the process, which we hear about, and securing the, and assuring the security of the vote. So let's get started. Our first speaker is going to be Debbie Bosma, who's the Pleasant View Township Clerk. Debbie worked for Boyne Highlands in accounting for 25 years and has been Pleasant View Township clerk for 31 years. I'm sure she's got stories to tell and she's seen it all. Debbie's going to explain what happens prior to voting, how to register to vote in the first place, and then how to apply for an absentee ballot when you need it. Our next speaker will be Julia Droyce, Charleboy County clerk. Julia became county clerk last January after five years as the election coordinator and vital records deputy clerk. Prior to that, she was deputy clerk for Norwood Township and was an election inspector for several years, another expert with lots of real world experience. Julia will describe the setup at the precinct polling place, the actual voting process in person or absentee, and then how the ballots are counted at the precinct level. Putting it all together, we turn to Susie Kuneen, Emmett County Clerk. Uh, Susie moved to Petoskey in 2011 and has been with the clerk's office since 2015. She became county clerk in 2019. She'll describe what happens after the votes counted at the precinct, the transmission of the precinct polling results to the county, what is the county board of commissioners, what do, I mean county canvassers and what do they do, and how does the results get transmitted to the state? Each of our speakers will have 10 or 15 minutes to explain their part of the process. And then we've allotted time for your questions at the end. We would like you to please enter questions in the chat box at the bottom. And League member Carolyn um, Penniman is gonna be tracking those. And at the end of the session, she'll be collecting them and asking your questions. And if we have time at the end, we'll ask you to unmute and ask questions directly. So let's get started. So Debbie, we're gonna to turn to you first. So what happens at the very beginning? How do you register to vote? Over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, first, I wanna start off with, um, we're all proud Americans and it's our privilege to vote in this great country. So please do vote and your vote does count. Um, basic registration is done in person or online at the Secretary of State's office, the County Clerk's office or the Township's office or via email um, in the forms that can be found online or requested from the County Clerk's or Township offices. Zero to 14 days prior to the election, you can register to vote at the clerk's office. You must have res residency verification, including the applicant's name and address, have a picture of ID and proof of residency. You can also register on the day of the election when meeting certain requirements. Absentee ballots. An absentee ballot is exactly the same as a regular ballot, but different. But the difference is the voter does not place their own ballot in the tabulator. The absentee ballots are processed on the day of election under strict privacy rules. We have specific procedures to follow state and countywide to ensure the statewide database is accurate. For example, an overseas or military balance is required to be sent out 40 days prior, I'm sorry, 45 days prior to the election. Mail ballot request 
must be received no later than 4 p.m. on Friday before the election. If a voter comes in on Monday before the election, they are not allowed to take their ballot with them. We are not allowed to hand ballots to anyone else other than the applicant with proper ID. Clerks are required to be in their office the Friday and Monday before the election and one day on the weekend. So check with your clerk's office to see which uh, weekend day they uh, decided to be open. Absentee ballot requests can be gotten at the state website or at the clerk's office. They can be requested to be sent automatically by signing up on a permanent AV list. This is not to be confused with the ballots being sent out automatically. Ballots cannot be mailed out with an app without an absentee ballot request form. We as clerks try to get the ballots out promptly with the shortest turnaround time. The last date that an absentee ballot to be mailed to you is the Friday before the election. Mail ballot requests may be received no later than 4 p.m. on the Friday before the election. If you know that you're going to be out of, out of town, do not delay in requesting your absentee ballots because the delays may occur with the mail. In other words, if you mail us a request, it takes several days for us to receive it. We process the receipt and then it can take a couple of days to get it back to you. You vote and then we take a few more days to get back to us. Now we're around two weeks. Once an absentee ballot request is received, the clerk makes sure everything on the request is filled out correctly. We go to the state website to verify the signatures. If, this, if there's questions about the signature, we check the voters cards, which show an additional signature. If they do not batch, we call, email, or send out letters requesting you to come to the clerk's office and show ID. It is very important to include your phone number and or email so we can get a hold of you promptly in case of a problem. Once the clerk receives the application request back and approves the signature as valid, the date, the application request, request the following information is recorded on the application and in, in the statewide database. The date it was received, the ballot number, and the date that the ballot was mailed out. If you change your signature, please stop at the clerk's office to update it on the signature card. Once you've received the ballot, place your, um, place your vote on the ballot, place the ballot back in the security sleeve and then into the mailing envelope. Remember to sign the outside of the return envelope. After the clerk receives the ballot, the, the signature and the ballot not, number is checked and verified against what is on the state website. If you make a mistake, do not panic. Your ballot, put your ballot back in the box. Put your ballot back in the mailing envelope and bring it into the clerk's office to be spoiled. The clerk can void the ballot in the state database after an affidavit of spoilage is signed. This ballot is never opened, but must be accompanied, accounted for at the end of each day. A replacement is then provided. All of this is in, entered into the state database. There are drop boxes outside most clerk's office. Contact your clerk's office to locate your drop box, which are securely locked and anchored. These are emptied daily. Extended office hours are offered the weekend prior to the election. Again, check with your clerk's office or websites. To ensure the accuracy of election, the clerk is running reports and balancing with the state database with his or her records to account for all ballots. After the ballot is returned to us, the signature on the ballot number is buried, verified and the clerk must then add the date of the return to the state database and onto the voter's application, 
election ballot request form. The clerk keeps all ballots in a secure spot. The clerk balances them on, on the day of election and then gives them gives the ballots to the trained and certified poll workers in charge of handling the AB ballots. The election officials process them by recording them in the database, separating the ballot from the personal information and handing the now anonymous ballot still in its secrecy envelope to the poll workers, a Democrat and a Republican who record the ballot in the tabulator. As you can see, there are many, many checks and balances to ensure the accuracy of legal election. Feel free to call your clerk if you have any questions. There are no, or any concerns, there are no stupid questions. Thank you. Uh, Debbie, I have just, I just want to clarify one quick thing before we go on. Um, just say again, what I, what kind of identification do you have to present when you register? A driver's license or a valid state ID, like okay. a military ID, a college ID, uh, a picture ID. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. So now, now we're, now we're registered to vote and we've, or we filled out our absentee ballot. So now we actually go to the precinct. And so Julia, what happens at that point? Hi everyone. Um, my name is Julia Drost. As Susan said, I'm the Charlevoix County clerk. Um, as a clerk, I wear many hats um, and I will have to say out of all of them, the election um, part of my job is something I take very seriously and I'm incredibly passionate about. And I feel very, thankful to be able to do. Um, so hopefully this doesn't get too boring because I think most of us probably have gone to the polls to vote. So I'll just give a brief overview and, um, and then if there's questions from there, like everyone said, we'll answer at the end. Um, but basically um, lots like the absentee ballot, um, when you go into the precinct to vote, you get um, an application that is to be filled out prior to obtaining a ballot. Um, at that point, uh, you are also um, supposed to produce some photo ID, um, driver's license, state ID, um, passport, um, things like that. Um, and between those two things, your address and your identity um, is verified. Um, the, the election inspectors, the first step after you fill out that application will be to um, they will look you up on the electronic poll book, which is downloaded the day prior um, from the most current information from the state. Um, so should have all of the voters um, that are currently registered on that day. Um, that machine is never online or on the internet. There's no, um, so that is all downloaded onto a flash drive the day before. Um, so when you come in, they sometimes swipe your driver's license or they'll just type your name in and look you up again, verify your name, address, date of birth, all of that kind of stuff. Um, after that has been verified um, and then they also do confirm that you haven't received an absentee ballot because that information is also recorded. Um, they uh, make sure also that you don't need to have any confirmation on your address or things like that. Um, they will go ahead and give you the a ballot, um, which at that point is recorded. There's a number on the top that's written down um, and recorded in the electronic pool book. Some people also do keep track of them by hand. Then it's um, also written on your application what style of ballot you get, the number of the ballot that you get. Uh, and then at that point, um, when I do election trainings, I always tell people at that point, if there's no available um, polling location or um, voting stations at that time, I mean, I wouldn't hand somebody a ballot because the last thing you want is somebody to walk out with that ballot if they get frustrated and it's busy and that kind of thing. So you want to withhold that until, you know, there's space for them to just go ahead and, um, you know, get in there and, and, and vote. So 
Um, another thing that kind of came up, I think, a lot last time was um, the uh, what's used when you vote um, as far as the writing utensil. Um, I know that there was a, an issue with the Sharpies and um, different things. Um, we use like, or we encourage um, everyone to use like those BIC um, sort of like little marker felt tip um, so they don't bleed through um, or pen. A lot of people look at those ballots and they want to use a pencil because it looks like a old standardized test that you're filling in the circle from, you know, like a million years ago, like when I was in high school. So um, people get really uncomfortable about the no pencil thing, but um, should be done with ink. Um, and at that point, um, if somebody were to need help, um, I guess that happens occasionally. Um, you know, everything is to be done in the polling location by twos. So a Republican and a Democrat ideally are supposed to um, help people if they have questions or um, even needed like a little maybe help physically getting to the, you know what I mean, to the voting booth, um, things like that. So um, best practices always um, answer questions and always give help in a two party um, team. Um, another thing, uh, we get questioned about sometimes as kids, you know, can you bring your child with you? Do you have to leave, you know, outside in the car with somebody else? But absolutely can bring your, you know, under 18 is, in, is, is considered a child. And, you know, at that point you can bring them in. And um, I, I think that's awesome if people do that. I mean, if your parents vote and they bring you in and you get to experience that, then, you know, the, the, the hopefully that'll mean in the future that you'll have um, kids that will grow up to do the same. Um, so at that point, um, you know, the ballot is filled out and completed. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, the only time a lot we have problems, it seems like our primaries, people cross things a little bit, and sometimes you have some spoiled ballots. So again, same with, you know, making a mistake on an absentee ballot. You know, if you make an error um, and you realize you filled in the wrong circle, something like that, you can always call for help. I'm pulling. Um, People can always spoil your ballot, reissue another. Um, so, you know, no, no pressure, uh, you know, to, to make a mistake and not have it be rectified. Um, you know, it's certainly an easy thing to do. Um, but at that point, if you're satisfied with your ballot after you fill it out, um, that uh, tab, we usually always kept on top with the number. Um, and then the, um, the election inspector in front of the tabulator will typically take that off and they keep those, you know, just again, another way to track things, another way, um, you know, to see that, that everything is, is been given out in the right way um, and it checks and balances sort of situation. Um, and then your ballot can be fed into the machine. Um, if on accident you have made an error, um, the tabulator will tell you. Um, it will kick it, it will flash an alert and, and tell you what, you know, whether maybe you've overvoted a race, you voted for, you know, three people instead of two, that kind of thing, um, that it will tell you. Um, another thing you can do um, that you have the right to do is to get a ballot and not vote it and then <laughs> actually cast it. So um, the machine will tell you if your ballot is blank. Um, it'll warn you, um, certainly can cast it anyway. Um, there's a button on our, everybody, there are three styles of machines, but on ours, um, there's a button either to reject it or to cast it. So um, with any of these errors, these um, ballots, if you choose to not redo something or if it's you know, the way you want it, I mean, you just can go ahead and push that button. Um, and then it flashes that, you know, your vote counted. And actually there's a number on the tabulator um, that, you know, will increase by one after you're there. So you can, um, people who doubt, you know, you can see it, it right there, live time counting. Um, and in fact, that is one of the procedures to sort of check and make sure that your numbers are lining up for your day um, in the polling location between the electronic poll book for people checking in um, when they're handing out ballots that keeps track of how many people that have been through the door and then the machine keeps track the tabulator keeps track of how many ballots it's counted now you want always those numbers to match um, that i tell people again when i do trainings like that is the biggest thing that you need to do all day long is to keep track of those two numbers and make sure that they are the same 
Um, if they are the same, then you have equal number of voters, equal number did ballots in the tabulator, then you are um, right where you need, you know, right where you need to be. Um, so um, at that point, um, you know, you are basically done with the process. Um, throughout the day, uh, election inspectors also process absentee ballots, um, as the other township clerk said. Um, they are, uh, you know, tasked with, um, again, helping people who may have questions, things like that. Um, so, um, again, that is pretty much the process. I was going to cover a little bit more about absentee ballots, but the, the first ladies did such a great job that I, uh, you know, I think that they've covered that. And so I will just leave it there and hope I saw some questions flash on the bottom of the screen, but I'll wait to the end and go ahead and answer those at the appropriate time, if that works. Thank you so much. Um, that it, it, there's a lot of, lot of moving parts going on during that actual voting process. Mm -hmm. And having been a poll worker, I know, and all the training that everybody goes through to make sure that everything matches, the signatures match, the numbers in the machine match the numbers who come in. So I'm aware from experience how all of that is checked at several points during the day. Okay, so now we voted. Um, so now let's turn to Susie and ask, how do the votes then get counted? What happens next? Thank you, Susan. I um, actually thought Julia was gonna talk a little bit more about um, closing the polls, but that's okay. I can. I'll, I'll do, you I can, that's okay. I can go through a little bit and um, we'll just take the questions like you said. Um, so once polls close at eight o'clock, um, the poll workers will um, close the polls on the tabulator. Um, and when they do that, a basically receipt tape of all of the votes for all of the candidates and all of the um, proposal questions that are on the ballot will print out all of those totals along with your total number of voters, as Julia mentioned. Um, all of that will print hard copy on your tabulator tape. Um, and then you have a receiving board that will, the election workers will print a couple of reports off of their EPB, which is a ballot summary report, a voter list, a remarks report, um, basically everything that they did that day, all the voters that came through the polls, all of that gets printed out and put into a hard copy um, full book book that has the statement of votes, um, and it has some carbon copies in there for the different envelopes that need to be submitted to the county at the end of the night. So um, the receiving board will prepare two envelopes. One of them's pink and it goes to the board of canvassers. Um, another one is like a cream color that comes to the county clerk. And then there's a white envelope that gets prepared for the local clerk. Um, and they all have a few different things that go into them. Um, one thing that goes into all of the envelopes is a statement of votes from the poll book um, and a tabulator tape. Um, all the applications to vote stay with the local clerk. Um, those are the only two things, that's two things that go to the canvassers is the statement of votes and the tabulator tape. And then the poll book um, with the tabulator tape comes to the county clerk. So um, all of those things are prepared by the workers at the end of the night. Um, this is when they make sure that all of their numbers match, as Julia had mentioned, um, their tabulator tape total matches the total of voters on their voter list from the EPB, um, and they don't have any discrepancies. If there is anything that's out of balance, um, then they have to explain why that is, because a ballot got jammed in the tabulator. Um, an election worker made a mistake on something, believe it or not, we're all human and that happens sometimes. So um, anything that happens um, that causes something to be out of balance has to have a remark or anytime a, a ballot is spoiled, that has to be annotated on the remarks. Um, so all of that stuff is checked at the end of the night by the election workers and these envelopes are prepared and then they are all sealed with a red paper seal. Um, 
So once all of that is done, then the local clerks have to transmit all of the results and that information to the county clerks. Um, so that happens in two ways. So there's an electronic process and there's an actual physical process of the local person bringing that information into the county. So first I wanted to talk about the, the electronic process. It's called modeming. Um, you probably heard that before, but it's modeming the results from the township precincts um, to the county. Um, that is done, first of all, it's not required for this to be done. The county can choose to do it or not to do it. Um, we do it in Emmett County, um, and what it does is it allows us it allows us to receive unofficial results quickly, um, so that we can report those unofficial results to the media to the public. Um, we will, um, as long as there's no issues, um, I generally have all of the unofficial results reported to me by 8:30 on election night um, because of the modeling process. So how that happens is there is a wireless modem in the tabulator um, that's only active after the clerk closes the polls and prints their hard copy tape. Um, it's only active for two to three minutes while it's sending that signal to the county's election management system or EMS system. Um, and that's not hooked up to the internet. It's done through a zero tunnel provided by Verizon. So that's how that process works. Um, and we get those unofficial results in our um, election management system at the county. In addition to that, the clerks are required to physically bring their envelopes and their program devices from their tabulators and express vote machines back to the county after they close the polls on election night. So what they bring us is they bring us the pink canvassers envelope and the cream colored um, county clerk envelope with both being sealed with that red paper seal. And then they bring their, their um, programming devices from their tabulators in a transfer bag that's also sealed. Um, it's the USB drive, that programming device is a USB drive that goes into their tab. Um, so that's what they're bringing to us on election night. The, the canvassers envelope goes directly to a representative from probate court. And it's kept with probate court securely until the canvas um, on when they meet, when the canvassers meet. Um, the seal is not broken and only the canvassers open that envelope. The county clerk envelope, we, myself or one of um, my staff goes through, will open that envelope with the local clerk there in front of them and basically kind of do a pre-check of what the canvassers are gonna look at to make sure there's no discrepancies or no questions um, for the local clerk that the canvassers might wanna know. So we go through and kind of do a pre-check of making sure the poll book is filled out. Um, there's required seal numbers to be in there for your ballot container, the transfer bag that the program devices come in, that seal number needs to be recorded in the poll book. All of the election workers that worked on that day need to be given an oath and sign the poll book. So we'll just make sure that all of those signatures are there, all those seal numbers are there. And then we will also make sure that their voter list matches their tabulator tape totals and matches the statement of votes totals in the poll book. Um, and that there's no out of balance um, ballot summaries. Um, and then if there are any, thing, any instances that need to be explained that local clerk can explain those things to us at the time so we can relay that information to the canvassers. So it's a great opportunity for us to make sure we understand what's going on in every precinct. Um, ideally, no one has any issues, all the numbers match and um, they can account for everything, which is what we shoot for. So um, that's what we're doing on election night. Um, and that's how we get the information from the local clerks. So then we, the county, myself, we, we deliver all of that information and those documents to the canvassers. Um, the canvas has to take place by 9 a.m. the Thursday following the election. Um, so I schedule mine for 9 a.m. on Thursday. Um, it just has to commence by then. That gives us a day to provide or to um, prepare any um, certifying documents that we need to prepare for the canvassers. 
It allows us to get all our reports organized so we can present that to them. Um, and, and they have everything that they need to canvas the election. So what happens on, on Thursday is the representative from probate court will bring that pink envelope, still sealed, hasn't been touched in, since the local clerk has put that statement of votes and tabular tape in it. They will deliver that directly to the canvassers. I will bring um, the county clerk envelope with the, with the poll book and the tabulator tape and the transfer bags sealed with the um, programming devices in there. Um, what the canvassers do, what they do is they will basically check everything that I've checked, but they will check the um, results in more detail. So they won't just check the totals, they will check the votes for each candidate, each proposal um, from each precinct. So they will take the reports from the election management system that we prepare for them. They will match those results to the tabulator tapes um, for, that came from the canvassers envelope, the county clerk envelope, and match those to the, um, the EMS report. So they are verifying all of those numbers and all of those totals, and that every precinct is, is balanced. And if they are, are out of balance, it, it is explained. Um, so that is what the canvassers are doing. Once they've verified that all of the results are correct, um, they, will, they will basically sign certifying documents saying, this candidate received this many votes, this candidate received this many votes, um, this proposal got this many yeses, this many noes, it has passed or failed, and they will sign those documents. Um, and once they're done, once they've certified everything, I will um, transmit those results to the state. If it's a state or federal election, we have to report those things to the state. Um, that is also done in two ways. Um, we transmit via a um, secure multi-factor sign-on website um, to, to the Bureau of Elections. Um, we actually do that on election night with um, unofficial results, and then after the canvas with the official results. And then within 24 hours of the um, canvas being complete, we also mail a hard copy of the results and certifying documents to the Bureau of Elections. Um, so that's how we transmit to, to the Secretary of State. Um, just another thing to mention, if a county doesn't do the motoring process, how those results are put into the election management system is through that USB programming device. We can put that directly into our computer with the EMS software, and then it uploads the results from their tabulator right to the computer without the modeling process. Um, so that's how that's done. Um, other than that, I think I'll just leave it to questions. And we've got a lot of those. Um, and Carolyn, if you <laughs> so you 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 folks raised a lot of good questions in everybody in lots of people's minds. Carolyn, I, I was kind of tracking them a little bit. Have you grouped them a, a bit for us so that we can be a little bit organized with the questions? You know, actually, I was just going to start at the top and um, let people jump in and choose to answer. I don't we don't have to direct it to a particular person. I don't think it's just, you know, just a quick response from whoever wants to address that particular question. So if that's all right with everyone, um, I'll just start at the top. So what are the requirements to register on the day of the election? Uh, you need a state ID of some sort. It could be a passport, um, driver's license, college ID, Military. Military. You also need to have proof of residence, so a bill that is in your name with the address that you're at. Um, okay. So anytime that the polls are open, you can walk in with those documents and register and then go ahead and vote. Yes. Thank you. Um, who empties the ballot box? 
daily. You know, prior to the election, I think you mentioned that the ballot box is empty daily leading up to election day. So who yeah. does it? Um, either myself or my deputy or the secretary, whoever gets here first thing in the morning, opens the box and brings everything in. We actually have a vault where we store everything. Um, so, which helps keep it, you know, safe and secure. Okay, and those are, are left sealed, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question was about the signature and what if someone changes their name due to marriage or another reason, and they don't change their signature at the clerk's office, can they still vote? Yes, they would have to prove to us that they're, they are that person um, with some marriage, some certificate. marriage certificate or information to, um, to that. And it may be a um, challenge ballot um, which gives us time to verify that they are who they are or they live where they do. Okay. Can I? Yes, go ahead. If that. Uh, typically, if people change their name, they do so through the Secretary of State. And at that point, they would sign a new MasterCard, which would be sent to the local clerk. So True. Uh, if they go in and, and change their name on their driver's license, um, in enough time, the, the local clerk might even actually have that new uh, voter card. So. Okay, great, thanks. Um, when we talked about the election workers, um, the question is, who are the election workers and what is their party affiliation? Well, I would say that your election workers are your friends, your neighbors, people who are from your community, people who volunteer their time, um, who get a hold of their local clerks and apply. Um, they're required to take training. Um, they are required to also declare a party. So they have to say that they're either a Republican or a Democrat. Um, we had libertarians for a while, but um, the amount, whether it's recognized as a major party is, has to do with the amount of votes that turn out usually for a gubernatorial race. And I don't think they had as many for the, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party last time. So um, now we're just required for just the Republican and Democrat. So. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and then um, we talked about having a state ID if they don't have a driver's license. And the question is, is there a cost to get a state ID? Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Anybody know that? No, I don't think there is. Okay. Okay, I know, I, I think I've read the, the legislature maybe is considering offering those for free or I don't, I don't know, but well, that's something we can explore further. Um, I think there's you, a fee. My brother is, is blind and needs a state ID and I think he had to pay for it. Okay. How long ago? Thank you, Lisa. Um, the next question, can you tell us more about the signature? Does the comparison occur at the polling place or only with the absentee ballot? It's brought up on the um, QVF system so that they can see it there also when they do it. So it's actually done in both places. Okay, thank you. Um, how would a blank ballot show up in the record? So a blank ballot would show up in the sense that it would count as a voter voting, but obviously if it was blank, it wouldn't count for any of the races. Okay, so so it would be a blank ballot that gets counted, but yep, there's it no counts vote. as a number for a voter, but it wouldn't okay. count as it voted for anything because it, it would be blank. That's why if you ever look at a results um, report or results tape, a lot of times, like the numbers are, diff the amount of voters are different from the amount of actual things that are voted. They're never the same. I mean, in the sense that some people you can pick and choose if you don't want to vote for something because you don't know about it, you don't have to. Sure. And the next one is what happens when someone fills in too many dots 
for a particular office, is it only that portion that's not counted or is the whole ballot invalid? Only that portion will not count. Um, and again, it, it, the tabulator will, will tell you that it's an overvote and it'll tell you which race. Um, so the voter can choose to you know, spoil the ballot and redo it if they want. But if they just don't have time or they don't care about that particular race, then they can just go ahead and cast it as it is and it just won't count that portion. Okay, thank you. Um, who actually checks the signatures for accuracy? Is it only one person or is there oversight? For the, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sitting off to the side. It's, did we freeze up? No. Okay. Um, it is. Amy, Amy, would you, um, would you turn around and introduce yourself? Uh, you're the Hi, deputy I'm clerk. Ami. Yeah, Ami, I'm you're the, next to Debbie. <laughs> and you're the yeah. deputy clerk, right? I'm the deputy clerk here, yeah. And what was the question again? How many Who people put the signatures? Okay. Usually it is myself or Debbie if it has to do with the absentee ballots. It's whoever is sitting with the electronic poll book and with the signups as they go through the line when they're doing the voting. Um, and they, they're checking against the cards and stuff too, and their actual ID, if it's an actual ballot in their ballot and they're voting at that place. If there's a question, how would that be resolved? If someone's not sure it matches, do you know, have you ever had that happen? I've never had that happen, but what you do have is, um, you would have their ID there. Their ID mm -hmm. matches, they've got their address matches at that point. And so you have some resolve and you can ask for an additional signature on their signature card at that point, if okay. their signature has changed that much. Because you have other things to check, the birthday, the address, mm -hmm. all of the other stuff. Okay. Yes. Fine. Great, thank you. So the next one is asking about filling the envelopes at the end of the night. How many people are checking and verifying that process? And who, who is filling those envelopes? That is done, mm -hmm. sure. That is done by the receiving board, which they are election workers. Um, and there is um, at least two um, inspectors doing that, it has to be, when they seal that ballot container and, and fill out that poll book, um, record that ballot container seal number, it has to be one Republican and one Democrat that sign that um, ballot tag. Um, so there's always at least two um, workers um, verifying and, and doing that process. Great. and. Can you give any examples of how or why a precinct could be out of balance? Um, well, Julia might have more experience with this, but it could be anything like if a ballot gets stuck in the machine and the tabulator advances a number and then you have to put it through again, it counts. So the tabulator advances two, but you've really only put in one ballot. So you'll know that when that happens if you get a jam or something like that, and that's when you make that remark. Um, I haven't had a lot of experience yet, so I, I haven't seen a lot of different situations. Maybe Julia has had more, but that, it's things like that that will mm -hmm. um, make, make, the, um, make it be out of balance. We had somebody take, a, I'm one of our precincts, somebody took a ballot once. I mean, so it's like, they got frustrated. It was a long, lengthy time to wait and, um, so no matter what you do, if you rerun the ballots, you can never, I mean, you can never get that back. I mean, like, so you're out of sync. You've given away more than you've tabulated. So it happens. Sure. Now, do you find errors happen very often or not? We have very, I, I mean, I, ha I have to say our, our township and city clerks do a great job. I mean, we typically don't have any out of balance precincts, but 
Our, um, ours as well. Our local yeah. clerks do a very good job. It's very, like Julia said when she was speaking, um, they're checking all day long to make sure those numbers are matching to avoid any um, confusion at the end of the night where they have to go back and, and find those errors. So um, our township clerks do a real nice job as well. Great. So where are the AB ballots, ABV ballots secured for the clerks who have an office in their home? If, if they're getting absentee ballots delivered to their home address, I'm assuming that's what this question is asking for absentee ballots. I don't know if we have anyone that has an actual home office or if everybody has a space at their hall usually. I think that's um, true for us as well. But either way, I would assume, you know, even if you had a clerk that was had a small township or that had a home office, I mean, I'm assuming they would be locked. You know, that's a requirement. Great. Is that, that's a, is that a state requirement that if that they have to put them in a locked facility? Um, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know if the township clerk maybe could speak to that. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a state requirement. I mean, it certainly is a, just a good idea, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, the, the ones that come in, I think that are actually filled out are to be secured. That and is I, a requirement. I think Julie, I think that's what the law states is secure. I don't think it says locked. I think right. it says secure with the local clerk. Mm -hmm. So Debbie, uh, you mentioned that you have a vault in your township hall. Uh, do you know what other township clerks do? No, I don't. Um, I would think that they would keep them in a locked drawer or, mm -hmm. um, you know, locked in their office in a, in a secret place, something like that. Yeah. Okay, good. Carolyn, we got any more questions? I'm just gonna briefly thank the people who did some research. A state ID costs $10, but it's free for people unable to drive or over 65. So oh. thank you for finding <laughs> those answers. Um, and someone is asking if, if our signature changes over time, you know, as we get older, um, could that be a problem for some people having their signature not match? Yes, um, signatures do, as you do get older, your signatures do change. We try very hard to look at the online signature and on our um, voter card to compare signatures. And sometimes, you know, the first letter will match and then maybe the last letter of the first name or um, two or three types of how you signed your last name. Um, matches enough so that you can tell it it's that person and you know that their their signature has be cha changed because of their age. And if Thank we really do have us, you know, if we aren't sure and we have a question, that's when we call or email and ask them to come in and show us their ID. Or okay, I'm going to call out to the office. Couple more quick questions. Um, someone raises the issue uh, the claim that dead people vote come from? Carolyn, I, th I personally, I think that people ask that question because of, you know, discrepancies with the voting rolls. People think our voting rolls are out of date. And, you know, it, just so people know, it is, we do update, you know, the deceased electors list um, is provided by the county to other counties, to the townships, um, to, to remove those people from the voter rolls. Um, but sometimes if they, you know, they die in an, another county, you know, it just takes a little while to catch up. Um, and then the canceling process for the, um, the voter rolls is extremely long. It takes a long time to cancel somebody from the voter rolls. Um, it, not if they've been deceased, but if, you know, they move, you know, there's a whole process where you have to send them certain documentation and they have to not vote in to state elections following that before you can cancel them. So it takes a long time to, you know, remove somebody from the voter rolls. 
And I think that's where people like kind of where this starts um, is, is from that, you know, people talking about that issue, just my personal opinion. Good, good, good things to think about. Um, another question is, is there training to learn how to verify a signature or is it up to each individual's judgment? The state has told me that it, um, I don't know of any training, but you have to do your best um, in your opinion as to whether that signature is correct or not, because you don't want to deny any voter the right to vote. Okay. Um, okay. Another question, go ahead. No, 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 are you, are you out of questions? Well, there's a couple more about Board of Canvassers, so I don't know okay. if we still have time to get to those. Yes, yes, let's try, that's, that's important. important. Who are the Board of Canvassers? Um, how do they get selected? And then this question says, um, I'll have to get back to it. If they believe their job is to deny the validity of the vote, I'm not sure I understand that question. Who are the canvassers? And what if they believe their job is to deny the validity of the vote? So the, the canvassers are just like your election workers. They are citizens from, from your community. Um, the process, how it, how it goes is the political party is actually um, submit three names to the county clerk um, when there's an open seat on the, um, on the board of canvassers. We just went through this. I'm sure Julia did as well. Um, we had a Republican and a Democrat seat. There's two Republicans, two Democrats. There's four canvassers. Um, and we had an open seat for each party because um, the terms were ending. And each political party from the county has to submit three names to the county clerk. And then the board of commissioners for the county selects one of those people for each seat, um, for each party, and, and that's how they're chosen. Um, as far as the validity of the vote, I'm not gonna um, speculate to any canvassers' intentions, but they are there to, it's basically just a um, administrative task where they are checking those numbers and making sure that they're correct. So, um, that's really as far as their duties go. They're not there to judge anything. They're just there to check the numbers. So, um, so and then they, cer they certify the election, right? They do for the local. Um, and, and yes, for anything, uh, the state certifies for if your state representatives are oh, cover more than one county, um, they certify the votes for our county, um, but then those results go to the state. Okay, and then another question, why don't the parties just choose their canvasser instead of the Board of Commissioners? Um, that's the, uh, how the election law, yeah, that's what statute. the election law requires. Yeah. I stand to. I think we're out of time and that was fortuitous. We're just at 6.30 with our <laughs> very last question. Um, Thank you, clerks, for joining us. Thank you for educating and informing us. And thank you for what you do. Um, you, you have quite a significant job. I, I know we all learned a lot more in detail about what it entails. And we appreciate what you do. So thank you for joining us. Thank you thank for you. having us. Anybody can unmute if you want to give them a good round of applause. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. We appreciate it.